All right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Imran Bashir. Thank you, Adam, for inviting me to this forum. So the title of my, pre my uh, presentation is Quantum Computing for Engineers in a Hurry. And some of you might be thinking, why I chose such a generic title? And I was putting these slides together. And I thought of this uh, proverbial joke between engineers and physicists. Engineers know a little about a lot, and physicists lot know a lot about little. So I thought, sticking to my engineering side, I might just trickle a whole bunch of information, little information about physics, uh, mechanics, uh, cryogenics, and electronics. So I thought a best title for that would be quantum engineer for engineers uh, in a hurry. So that's the title of the talk. So before we get into the details, I want to just give you my personal oddity, uh, odyssey into quantum computing. I got my PhD in electrical engineering in 2014. And uh, I'd been working in uh, semiconductor electronics uh, business for 20 plus years. I worked for a few Fortune 500 companies. And then back uh, four years ago, I joined this quantum computing startup called Eco One Labs. And uh, soon after, I realized that there was a huge gap between the technology I was working in and my knowledge is experience from the past. And as someone who wants to understand technology deeply, um, I felt like it was time for me to go back into the classroom. So a few years later, I decided to join the Masters of Science Quantum Technology Program at San Jose State, uh, where I'm surrounded by Gen Z students. It's a very interesting experience to be back in the classroom. Uh, but I think that investment of time and capital is, is going to be over the long run beneficial as I progress professionally in this uh, quantum work uh, space, workforce. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. And let's talk a little bit about Equal One Lab before we get into the details. So who are we? Eagle One is an extremely experienced team of physicists and engineers, and some of us have worked on some very high volume, impactful businesses. Uh, at least three of our founders of Eagle One Lab have worked on the commercialization of digital radio processor technology, which was invented at Texas Instruments back in 2000. And that single invention was responsible for billion dollar revenue of TI's wireless and derivative products um, for the cellular phone market. Uh, we are currently BC backed by Atlantic Bridge and MetaWave uh, and also get part of our funding from European Innovation Council. We have taped out multiple generation of quantum silicon chips uh, in the past five years, and I'll show you some uh, micrographs of that in this presentation. And our business proposition um, is to design, develop, and sell compact uh, quantum servers that could be seamlessly integrated with a high-performance computing ecosystem. Okay, so with that, let me give you a brief outline. A majority of the presentation is going to be the, my favorite section called Quantum Computing for Engineers in a Hurry, where we kind of go through a potpourri of subjects in physics, thermodynamics, electronics, and a little bit of software. And then the latter part of the presentation is going to be uh, the equal one silicon qubit technology and uh, the hardware cryogenic electronics solution. Okay, so first question, what does it take to build a quantum computer? Well, why don't we look at a, another historical monumental effort uh, called the Apollo 11 missions? Do you know that the Apollo 11 workforce comprised of over 400,000 engineers in all these disciplines? Well, building a quantum computer is kind of like that. The quantum computers being built today and shipped as product hire mechanical engineers to develop the cryocooler, the compressor, vacuum pumps, and pipes and uh, helium circulation. There are systems, systems and hardware engineers to control the instrumentation, cable plans, cryogenic samplers, uh, sensors, and amplifiers. They hire software engineers to handle automation, calibration, and uh, computation. And they hire physicists to uh, design the physical substrate. And more recently, we're seeing an influx of electrical engineers and specifically IC designers to design what I call the cryogenic controller integrated circuit, which we'll discuss in detail in this presentation. So this is a new trend, and it's going to be a growing trend in the future. So now that we've talked about the workforce and the disciplines uh, required to build a quantum computer, what does a quantum computer look like from a block diagram perspective? Well, here's an illustration. So at the very bottom of the stack, we have what's called the quantum plane. And this is where the physical qubits reside. And it can be built with many different modalities. You can build them using superconductors, semiconductors, photonics, trapped ions. Above that layer is what I call the IO routing and the multiplexing layer. This is where we formulate a highly dense packaging solution. It's still an active area of research, and this is going to get more and more traction as we're scaling our quantum cores to thousands and hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of qubits in the future. 
Then above that, we have what's called a cryogenic control, uh, not cryogenic, but a control and readout plane, uh, which basically can be done in two ways, either with room temperature electronics as rock mount instrumentations, or as integrated cryogenic electronics, which will be the proposal for this presentation. And the function there is to do quantum control and readout on um, the quantum qubit modalities. Above that, we have what's called a software layer, and that is basically the workhorse for many interesting new ideas and emerging science with quantum plus AI error correction, encoding, development of state classifiers, and development of efficient transpilers that map a quantum problem to a quantum hardware. Okay, with that in mind, let's talk about how electronics is built uh, around a quantum computer today. So we start with our physical qubit substrate, which is sitting at the, the 20 millikelvin temperature state. And then we couple that with room temperature electronics, uh, which is sitting in as rack mount instruments. And they include arbitrary waveform generators, which are designed to operate on the qubits to perform a particular quantum operation. And then it has multiple receiver channels, and the receiver channel basically are designed to measure the state of the qubit, whether it's spin or is measured as current using log and fire, or is measured as a reflected signal out of a reflectometry apparatus. Then in the middle of all this is where we have a bunch of discrete components like couplers, LNAs, and isolators and attenuators. Now the question is, if you want to scale this qubit substrate to millions of qubits, you're going to immediately run into some challenges with cabling, first of all in your cable plant. I define the cable plant as the number of wires that go down your cryostat, this stuff here. So if you need millions of qubits, you need lots of wiring for not only control, DC biasing, but also for readout. Secondly, if you push as ma as that many wires into your cryostat, at some point you're gonna start violating the thermal budget uh, specification of the fridge. So the question is, what is this thermal budget specification and how does it affect our quantum computer architecture? For that, we need to go into thermodynamics. So we look at this chart here, which basically shows um, passive heat load measured for each different type of cable at different stages in a dilution fridge. Of these of interest to us are the stainless steel UT85 cables, which are used for uh, routing RF signals into the cryostat, and then these twisted pair of signals, which are routed for uh, carrying DC signals into the cryostat. If we look at our thermal load specification for the stainless steel cable of one milliwatt, and I use it to calculate um, against the 1.5 watt cooling power I have in my fridge at four Kelvin stage, I can theoretically use 1500 cables uh, before I can hit the thermal load limit at four Kelvin in the dilution fridge. I can carry out a similar calculation and the maximum number of cables theoretically I can stack in a quantum computer would be 1500 or so. But now the problem is number one, this is not enough for controlling let's say a million qubits. Number two, how do you install, repair, and maintain this amount of cabling inside a cryostat. And number three, cabling is not the only thing that's inside a cryostat. You need some passive components. You need couplers, you need LNAs, and those are bulky components, and there's not enough space in a fridge to put all of that. So the question is, is there an alternative? How do we solve this problem as we scale our quantum processors? Well, the idea there is to take our current situation where we have room temperature electronics, and move it to a four Kelvin stage in an integrated circuit solution shown here. Now with this kind of a solution, we have done a couple of things. First advantage is we have dramatically simplified our cable plant going down the cryostat from room temperature to four Kelvin. Number two, our cryogenic controller IC and qubit are now sitting relatively close to each other, you know, and that allows us a little more seamless control between controller and readout operation. Third, our qubit substrate is sitting at 20 millikelvin stage. Our cryogenic control IC is four Kelvin stage. They can be designed in their native substrates for optimum performance and they're isolated. Fourth, we're sitting at four Kelvin with our control controller IC, which gives us 1.5 watts of cooling power. And that's quite a lot. And with that, you can stack many transmit receive chains and that helps you in scaling your cryogenic controller IC solution for a large qubit array. Now that said, there are a few limitations. Number one, the IO bottleneck between the qubit array and the controller is still not solved. So you have to still think about smart ways of interfacing, developing this interface. And that would involve either doing some advanced packaging, bumping, or multiplexing. So this is still an active area of research. OK, but then uh, the question is, is there another better solution than this? Well, that takes us from sort of a two chip solution to a, a single chip solution where we combine the control electronics with the qubit array as shown here. 
Now, with this kind of a solution, there are a couple of advantages. First of all, the I.O. bottleneck is completely resolved because I have solved the routing problem. I can draw miniaturized wires in advanced CMOS process at nanometer scale and spread them across an XY plane. That's a very normal thing to do. So the routing is not an issue. And number two, these guys are sitting just on the same chip. So I have minimized parasitics. I can drive large bandwidths and do a more seamless control than the previous two aforementioned solution. But now there's a consequence of this architecture. Well, first, that our cryogenic control IC was designed in a standard CMOS process, where typically our qubit arrays are designed in exotic semiconductor substances that are more um, better performance. But now, with this kind of an architecture, we have to design our qubit array in standard CMOS process, just like these other transistors sitting in the controller IC design. And the second issue now is because we have these localized electronics, it cannot obviously run with the thermal load of microwatts of power. They're going to be burning a lot of power. So you need to move the chip up to an elevated stage, somewhere between one to four Kelvin, where you have reasonable cooling power to put this design in, which now means that your qubit array, which traditionally used to sit in mid Kelvin temperature stage, is now sitting somewhere between one and four Kelvin stage. Hence, the new term that's coined in literature these days called a hot qubit. A hot qubit is something that sits at these elevated temperature stages compared to the conventional solution. So what that means is for this solution to work, this qubit array now needs to deliver a quantum metrics uh, that are insensitive to temperature, these elevated temperatures. OK. Now let's get into a lot more of the physics of how these quantum dots are designed and how they interact with AC and DC magnetic fields. So this figure here is what I call the heterostructure. This is done by combining typically an aluminum gallium arsenide with a gallium arsenide layer, which is a 3,5 semiconductor compound. By interfacing these two layers like this, you create a band gap at this interface, which, charge, which traps charge and confines charge in the Z direction. If you look at the substrate from the top, it looks something like this. Now, if I want to trap charges in the XY plane, I introduce these metal electrodes, which are called barriers and plungers. And by applying different voltages, I can tunnel electrons from a reservoir, which is a source where I can source electrons from, and confine to the small area. The small white dot is what's called a quantum dot. Once I have an electron confined here, I can change its spin by using uh, electromagnetic fields. Now, this might look like a, a quantum mechanics 101 lecture, but believe me that the simple rendering of particle in a box from quantum physics and applied it to um, electron and a quantum dot gives us some very valuable information and insight about the, the, the apparatus we're dealing with. So what I do here is I model my quantum dot as this um, uh, zero potential with of, uh, of length L surrounded by some finite potential on the edges. I assume I have an electron in this box, which has a wave function that looks like this, and it has a continuous slope of these boundaries. Then I solve this system using Schrodinger's uh, time independent equation and to figure out what the discrete energy levels are which comes out to be this de these degenerate energy levels E of n. Now, equating this uh, with the momentum and kT, I can derive what's called the de Broglie's equation. And using this de Broglie's wavelength equation, I can define the confinement or criteria for my electron, meaning what is the size of my quantum dot L for which the electron is going to be confined for this given temperature and mass of electron. So if you plug these numbers in, L comes out to be somewhere in the range of 410 nanometers. But in order for our quantum dots to be efficient and more reliable, we usually you design this for to be an order of magnitude better, better than this dimension. So typically, the quantum dots would be less than 100 nanometers. And it's possible with advanced photolithography process, we can make these very, very miniaturized devices. And this is the ultimate promise of scaling qubits. Silicon qubit technology allows you to do that because you can draw these microscopic structures and an array, large array, to meet the promise of millions of qubits. OK. So we have already figured out what our quantum dot does with a zero magnetic field. We have these degenerate energy levels. Now what happens if I apply a DC magnetic field in the Z direction? My Hamiltonian takes this form here. I solve this Hamiltonian. I apply these eigenstate vectors, uh, eigenstates that happen to be spin up state and spin down state of my electron. And by applying this to my Hamiltonian, I can compute my eigen energies, E's of plus and E's of minus. Now you might be wondering, well, what's the significance of all these eigen energies? Well, what it does, it takes these degenerate energy levels we had before and then splits them into two. Each degenerate energy level splits into two, E's of plus and E's of minus. And this is also called Zeeman split. And you might wonder, well, what's the significance of that? Well, let's go to the next slide. Here we kind of talk about what's called the measurement method. I have already got an electron that I've trapped in a quantum dot. I've encoded my information in its spin. Now I need a way to figure out how to read the information with classical electronics. One method to do that is called energy selective readout where I translate electron spin into charge or current that can I measure with circuits. 
Well, how do we do that? Well, in this apparatus, we take our quantum dot, couple it to a reservoir from which I can get electrons. I first flush it out. And then I move these energy levels, let's say with some voltage control on the quantum dot, move it below the Fermi level. And now I can have two possible scenarios. Either an electron which spin down occupies this higher energy level, or an electron which spin up occupies this lower energy level. Now, if you looked at the progression of thought in the previous slides, you probably should be able to appreciate the fact that this actually represents our Hamiltonian from the previous slide. These are the two eigenstates of our Hamiltonian occupying these two eigenenergies, the higher energy level for the spin down state and the lower energy level for the spin up state. Now, if I want to do rate up, what I do is I park these two energy levels right in the middle of this Fermi level. And now I can have two scenarios. If I was in this spin down state at this high energy level, electron jumps from the state quantum dot to the reservoir and then immediately backs into this lower energy level. This was caused a change in current, and that change in current can be picked up by a charge sensor. And it shows up as this current blip. In the other state, nothing happens. So we basically get a flat current line. So now I have a way of encoding spin, which is my quantum information, coupled to a current or a charge. And I can measure these using electronic circuits. I can put in a current buffer, a current amplifier, or an integrator. And then it's off to the races with classical electronics. OK. Lastly, let's look at a more complicated scenario where I, instead of applying just a DC magnetic field, I also apply an AC magnetic field B sub 1. This is what I call an excitation signal. This is called excited signal because this is what's com coming from my control electronics, from my AWGs. Now, with this kind of a scenario, your Hamiltonian becomes time dependent, so it looks a little complicated, but we use tricks in physics, uh, such as rotating frame approximation and perturbation theory to make it time independent. And now we're able to solve our state vector psi and time evolve it, but it just looks like this complicated equation, but we can easily look at it graphically in a minute. But if you look at this equation, you have two frequency terms, an omega naught, which is called the Larmor frequency, uh, which is a function of the DC magnetic field, and omega one, which is the Rabi frequency, which is linked to the AC magnetic field, small signal applied here. Now the state vector animation is shown here on the top right, which is showing the trajectory of the vector as it's changing state from spin up to spin down, all due to this small excitation signal I apply. Now, a more proper mathematical representation would also include Larmor precession, but I'm not showing that here. But if you can imagine in your head, there's another rotation, fast rotation going on in the XY plane. But ignoring that, if you just look at it, now I have the ability of changing my spin state from spin up to spin down by applying this AC magnetic field. And now if I apply Born's rule, which we learn in quantum mechanics, I can compute the probability of spin down, which has this scalar term attached to the equation. And what this scalar term is dependent on is the delta W term. Delta W term is the difference between my excitation signal frequency and my Larmor frequency. If I make my excitation signal frequency equal to the Larmor frequency, the scaling term, this becomes one, and I get a maximum flip between my probability of zero and probability of one, which is what we want. So in summary, I apply, in order to operate spin qubits, I need A, a DC magnetic field to do Zeeman split, which allows me to do readout of my state using Zeeman split and the energy selective readout. And B, I need a small AC magnetic field, which allows me to do spin rotation. And from there, we can go on to build different operations, gate operations, and quantum gates. OK, now enough of the physics. Let's talk about electronics. And what are we doing at equal one? So at the heart of our chip is what's called a quantum processor unit. The quantum processor unit at the center includes a quantum structure. And here's a figure shown here. It has several quantum dots on these two rows. And around this quantum structure, we have localized control electronics. So our qubit counts range from, depending on the kind of structure we're using, from anywhere from six quantum dots or six qubits to 240 quantum dots. And we couple this to electronics, uh, 32 capacitive DACs, which act like um, charge injectors, which drive all these voltages, the barrier controls in the quantum structure to manipulate different operations. We have eight localized detectors, which can measure the state of our qubit. We drive our capacitive DACs with high-speed pulse generator in order to perform different kind of spin rotations, pi operations. We also have a quantum reference bias circuit, which establishes DC voltages for all the gate controls in the quantum structure. And then lastly, we have what's called a pattern generator. The pattern generator is the command and control, which controls timing for all control electronics on the chip. OK. So the pattern generator uh, needs a little more description because it's a very critical block in the chip. So the, the pattern generator basically is a large memory block which stores all our quantum experiment sequences in a unique address. And once we load this 
uh, sequence of experiments and we trigger it, it plays out that pattern on a 64-bit bus. And that 64-bit bus is basically going to all the cryogenic electronics uh, next to the um, quantum structure. And basically, we can play a bunch of quantum experiment sequences in either a staggered sequence, a continuous loop, or a fork sequence. Uh, there are variations of options here. Inside each quantum experiment sequence, we have a whole bunch of sub-operations. We either do a load operation, free charge, initialization operation, quantum experiment operation, spin flips, such as, and a readout operation. And these operations are pre-programmed, and we do it offline before the quantum experiment is executed in order to reduce noise uh, injected into the qubit. OK, the quantum structure is designed using uh, similar materials, the materials uh, for FDSOI transistor. Um, the, in this case, we're using 22 nanometer FDSOI process from Global Foundry. The quantum dots are of dimension 70 by 70 nanometer in this region and in this region. And they're separated by barrier gates, which are 20 nanometer wide, shown by this blue region. And the electron is confined in a thin silicon film in between the gates in this region and in this region. So this is an example of a two quantum dot or two qubit system. And then we control these gates electrostatically with voltage uh, or the voltage, common mode voltage applied on the source and the drain. OK, so we got our quantum dots. We got our qubits. We understand how to control them. But how do you scale this? Well, here's one example. This was one of our largest quantum structure of 240 quantum dots. And we spread these 240 quantum dots over eight rows, where each row has 30 quantum dots. And then we attached uh, localized electronics, these capacitive DACs, to control uh, all of these control gates, barrier controls. And then at the edge of each row, we attach our detector to do measurements. And then you might notice these double V structure. Uh, there's a significance to that. This close interaction region allows you to entangle two qubits. So you can look at this double V shape as a C naught gate. And with these C or C naught gates that I have in this structure, now I can start talking about mapping a quantum algorithm to this physical qubit layer. OK. Um, so here's an IC micrograph of our chip. Basically, each quantum processor unit uh, has all these electronics. And the qubit, is, you can see, is a very small area. It's only a few microns apart. Even the largest structure of 240 quantum dots only occupies something like 4 micrometer by 2 micrometer. Most of the area is occupied by control electronics. So in the north and south of the qubit array, we have control uh, capacitive decks. East to west side of the quantum structure, we install the detectors for measurements. And then we put these in a, in a tile them in a matrix shown here, where each tile includes a different quantum experiment cell or a quantum structure. We bond the chip using flip chip and put it on a PCB like this. And the backside of the chip can be then uh, made to contact with a cold finger for a cryogenic cooling. And this board then goes inside our cryostat. OK, I'm watching the time here. So OK, last slide or last two slides. So we put it all together. As I promised, I'll show you a small quantum computer. So uh, here it is on the left side. Um, and the reason why we did our own cryogenic uh, cryostat development was because we want to uh, kind of fan these systems out across multiple sites in order to do a more efficient way of characterization of our quantum structures. So this machine here, almost desktop size, includes all the components you need for cryogenic cooling. It has a vacuum pump. It has helium pipes. It has a two-stage Gifford McMahon cooler uh, and a compressor. So if you see the inside the bucket where cooling happens, we have our flex line, which carries all the DC wiring and low frequency signals. And RF signals are carried over coax cables shown here. And this apparatus is able to achieve 3.3 uh, Kelvin base temperature with a 200 milliwatt cooling power. And its power consumption is 1.5 kilowatt. You can run this off a 110 volt line with a 16 amp single phase car. So you can literally order these and put it in your living room to impress your neighbors. OK, last slide. A few final thoughts. It takes a village to build a quantum computer, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, electronics engineers, physicists, everybody. And to be valu valuable in quantum workforce, it requires you to know a little bit about electronics, mechanical mechanics, physics, software, and algorithms. And for some of you who are wondering how we can get into quantum computing, it's not never too late to learn. I'm still learning, even after all these years of experience in education. Attend workshop, take classes, and immerse yourself into seeking knowledge. Because as some wise man once said, Knowledge is power. Thank you very much, and I'd like to take your questions now.